We don't know if we have the strength to face what is before us, hunting us, hurting us. We huddle around a table and hold the leaky vessel, and we sing what comes to mind. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. I had a little drink about an hour ago and it's gone right to my head. Wherever I may roam on land or sea or foam, you can always hear me singing a song, show me the way to go home. Home, the prophet Jeremiah speaks of a branch that will be raised. Jesus spoke of a son of man that will descend. Both point to a hope, a hope that calls us home, our true home, where we were welcomed and loved and included, where there is justice and equality and peace. It is time. This Advent season, it's time to go home. We light the candle as a sign of our hope, our strong hope that there is a way to go home, to the home in Christ. And it starts with us. It starts here. It starts now. It's time to go home. to come help me I have to tell you back in the day a long long time ago I was a cheerleader did you know that and I'm going to do a cheer this morning and I'm going to need your help can you do this Come on up here and do your cheer moves. Yeah, you know, I got a pro here helping me. Okay, congregation, we're going to need your help. Give me an A. A. Let's try that again. Give me an A. A. Give me a D. D. Give me a V. V. Give me an E. E. Give me an N. N. Give me a T. T. What's it spell? What's it spell? What's it mean? (laughs) Christ is coming. That's what Advent is about. Christ is coming. And I had a professional cheerleader here helping me do that. We're celebrating. The next few days until Christmas is what we call Advent, Amelia. Look at you go. The days that that we, we celebrate... We're cel- oh, he's going to get your picture, I think. And, and uh, we're celebrating the time between now and Christmas is waiting for Jesus to be born. Are you ready for Jesus to be born in your heart? Well, most of us aren't. <laughs> but we're working on it. We've got, we've got a good four weeks to do that. And I appreciate you coming and helping me. Helping me as a professional cheerleader. Give me five. We'll do it this way. Thank you, Amelia. Brody, you can go sit down. The, today's reading is from the Affirmation of Faith. It's on page 883 in the red hymnal. Please join in the Affirmation of Faith. <coughs> we are not alone. We, we live, live in God. God's Word. We, we believe, believe in God, God who, who has created and is creating. creating. On his son, Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new. 
who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church. We celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. This has been the word of God for the people of God. As we begin our prayer time this morning, I want to uh, want us to be aware of some losses in our community. Um, John Friday's sister, sister Mark, did I say that right? Uh, died yesterday. She she's she was a nun, and uh, so and she was in the mother house and. So they didn't get to spend the last few hours with her, but I hope that you'll be with that family and lift them in your prayers. Holiday times aren't always happy for families who are experiencing their first, second, third, 20th time without loved ones who once gathered around the table to celebrate. Are there others that we would lift in prayer this morning. We'll save more for joys and concerns. I just wanted to pray for, pray for your aunt this morning. Let us pray together. Gracious, loving God, we come to you in the season of Advent, experiencing and expecting the coming of Christ. This church has chosen... As our motto for Advent, come home to the light. May we come home to the light that is in Jesus. May we spend our Advent time on that journey to the Christ child where we find home and heart and happiness and peace and joy and hope and all that the Christ child represents. It is a time of joy, it's a time of expectation, it's a time of excitement. It's also a time of remembering, remembering the loved ones who spent Advent and Christmas time with us who are no longer here. We lift in our hearts those who we are missing this Advent season. We know that their destiny is in your hands and their legacy is in our hands, O oh God, and may we live up to the legacy of those who have gone before us, who have paved the way into life everlasting. Oh God, we, we feel a sense of, of stirring and excitement about our church. We, we've gotten ready for Advent. We're getting ready for a spaghetti supper. We're getting ready to participate in the Christmas parade. And there's so much more to this season of coming home to the light. We ask that your light... The light of Christ lead us into that unbounded future. That future that you have in store for us. That future that represents hope. The hope that will never, never leave us. The hope that always says this is not the end. And as your people of hope, we pray together the prayer of our tradition. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to give thanks for everyone who helped make this worship service possible this morning. My brother wrote a thing in Facebook, and he's calling it 90%. He says, we all think we're 90% of all that, our effort's 90% of all that we are and all that we do. And he said, you know what? He said, Not, you just got to show up. And he said, 90% of all who I am and all that I have accomplished and all that I will accomplish is, is other people. Other people who have converted me, who have encouraged me, who have shown up. That's the way it is with church, too. I'm only 10%, but I appreciate the other 90%. Let us listen for the word of God that comes to us from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus is saying these words. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your hands, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree. And all the trees, as soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to pray for me as I pray for you this morning. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be found acceptable to you. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The gospel writer Luke this morning says, be prepared, be awake, be alert. Matthew says, watch and pray. I know all about that whenever Oklahoma State plays Oklahoma in football. Because Oklahoma State has not won since 2014, and I can't remember before then. I know they won in 95. But when I watch OSU football, I watch and pray. And last night my prayers were answered. Go Cowboys! The kind of watching and praying that Jesus is talking about in this scripture is a whole different kind of watching and praying. I learned in seminary a long time ago that apocalyptic literature, literature about the end times, tells us more about what's going on with the people who wrote it than it does about what's going on in our lives. I need to tell you a little what was going on when, when Luke wrote this scripture. 
in about 85 CE, 15 years after the temple had been destroyed. A million Jews had been killed. The rest were taken as slaves, mostly into Rome. Did you know that the Colosseum in Rome was built from the spoils of all, the, all of the worship items they took from the temple in Jerusalem? And they used Jewish slaves to build it. That's the kind of thing that was happening when Matthew was writing. Matthew likely was a child when the temple was destroyed and many people were killed. I'm reading a book by my seminary professor, Brandon Scott, and I think he's one of the best New Testament scholars in the world. And it's called After Jesus, Before Christianity. There's about 150 to 200 years in there before Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And in the time of when Matthew was writing, Domitian was the emperor of Rome. He did not like democracy because those Jews were beginning to multiply, and there were a few of them out there, those Jewish slaves. And so it, he wanted to rule with his own iron fist, and he did. He killed lots of Jews in those days, and so people like Matthew who are writing are writing somewhere, somebody's got a little money so that they can get the papyrus and, and the ink and whatever it takes for them to write. Somebody's given him a safe place to write. And what else we know about Matthew is he is steeped in Jewish tradition. He may have actually been the son of, of a, a priest or someone because he knew a lot about the Jewish faith at a time when it was dangerous to talk about it. And in these, and what happened with the Jesus people, the Jews who survived, most of them were Jews until Paul comes along and invites a few Gentiles. And mm, the Jews didn't like that too well because they thought those Gentiles would eat anything. And, but they, they had these little Jesus communities. And people, eight or ten, would gather together and, and they would eat together. These were the, this was the early, early communities of Christ. They resisted the Roman government, and they ate together. Most of the people who gathered had lost at least one or two family members when, when Jerusalem was sacked. And others had, had, lost, had lost family members to the Roman government because it was dangerous to be known as a Jew. And so these people would gather secretly, and they would eat together, and they would talk, and they would tell the stories of Jesus. And Matthew was in one of those communities, and he wrote this down. This is what somebody remembered about Jesus. He said, the Son of Man is coming on a cloud to redeem you. What we know about that first century after Jesus died, people really were expecting Jesus to come back in the flesh. I mean, there was that that expectation that Jesus would come on a cloud. And, and in that culture and in that time, coming on a cloud meant that he was a god. That's where the gods came from. They came from the sky and the clouds. And so Matthew was expecting that from Jesus at any time. What I'm hearing in the apocalyptic literature, the end times literature of, he, of, of what I'm reading here is what was really going on. Keep alert, stay alert. Hyper vigilance. Most of the time I know of people being in hyper vigilance, they're at war. You're looking over your shoulder every minute of every day to make sure you can stay alive. Abused children do the same thing. Eventually, people who live with that kind of hyper vigilance develop PTSD or some other kind of psychological illness. That's probably what was going on in this community. They were killing their friends. They had to hide out to talk about Jesus. The days were dark and long and lonely. They heard the story about the, how the temple had been ransacked and they were using the, the spoils from the temple and the, and the slaves to build the Roman Colosseum so they could turn the Christians out to the lions. These were some dark, dark days 
in the history of our religious ancestors. Everyone was afraid. Everyone was looking over their shoulder. There were some Jewish people, there were some Jewish uh, scholars and, and, and people of means and wealth who defected to Rome and would, would, would snitch on their Jewish friends to tell them where they, the soldiers could go and, and, and kill their friends. These were dark, dark times. I had never known that before until I read this book. But Brandon is a very, very good scholar. And by the way, I try, I study, and I search, and I try to bring you the very best scholarship I can find every Sunday morning. And this is pretty good scholarship. I learned a lot by reading this book. I never realized that the time after Jesus' death had been so hard for his followers. Most of them were Jewish. A few were Gentile. And Paul had gathered the Gentiles and invited them into these communities. They were resisting the Roman government the best way they could. They knew that they had no power to do so. Their power had to come from God. Their power had to come from their faith. And so in the midst of all of this, Matthew remembers a story of Jesus and writes it down. It says, the Son of Man is coming. Wait and watch. Be alert. Words of hope. And it is good for us to watch and pray. I don't think it's so good for us if we don't have to to watch and pray to the extent these people were looking over their shoulders every minute knowing they might be killed. But I'm thinking as Christians today who we survived COVID and, and in many ways that time is a lot like the time Matthew in which Matthew wrote. In the midst of all of that, Yes, we were afraid. I remember staying in my home 40 days and 40 nights and having all the drop a bag of groceries at my front door because I was scared to death I was going to get COVID and die. Some of us have been there. But in the midst of all of this, Matthew offers a word of hope. Hang on, Jesus is coming. Hang on, it's going to get better. Hold on. The word of God prevails. Hold on, you little communities of faith out there hidden out. Hold on to the words of Jesus. Hold on to the teachings of Jesus. Hold on to hope. We worship a God of hope who turns coal into diamonds who turns sand into pearls, who turns worms into butterflies. And think what God can do with us. I got to go to Branson on my vacation for a few days, and we passed by the Branson United Methodist Church. And one day I'm going to be able to show you a picture of what I saw. But they had this awning out front. I loved it. And it says, it's big. You can see it from the streets when you're driving by in Branson. It says, hope begins here. Isn't that a wonderful message from a church? Hope begins here. And I wonder how many people in our community need a word of hope, need a gesture of hope, need somebody to say, hang on, it's going to get better. I know you all have done that for me. Being away for a few days made me realize what a wonderful gift you all have been in my life. You have given me much hope. I was retired sitting home in Bentonville, Arkansas, wondering what God's going to do next. <laughs> you gave me hope. You have helped me heal. I, I was chaplain at the Oklahoma Children's, Methodist Children's Home, and I was also on their board for many years, and we had a, we had a director who said, Love and acceptance can heal wounds that can be healed in no other way. You all have done that for me. 
And I know if you've done it for me, how much you've done it for people in this community. You are a community of hope. And how we're going to figure out how to play that out in the next few months as we come, hopefully come back from the COVID crisis is going to be interesting. It's going to be exciting to see how you all offer hope to this community, how, how we help people understand this is not all there is, help people understand things will get better. The circumstances, let's see, hope is never determined by the circumstances of our lives. Hope is determined as a gift from God. Hope is never determined by the circumstances of our lives. But the circumstances of our lives are always determined by hope. We are a people of hope. We are a people who read these scriptures that have come to us miraculously. When you consider what happened to to Jesus' people for almost 200 years, the fact that we have four Gospels is a miracle. That we have the words of Jesus written down by someone who told him what Jesus had said. We are a people of hope. Those people soldiered through those rough times. They kept the stories of Jesus alive. And if they can do that, so can we. We are a community of hope, offering hope throughout our community. God has called us to this mission. And may we all be found faithful. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, we are expecting the coming of Jesus. Not as a God on a cloud, but as a baby in a manger. Vulnerable, full of hope and possibility and wisdom to lead us on into that unbounded future. Keep hope alive in our hearts. Grow hope in this church and help us to spread your hope throughout our community as we come home to the light for Christmas. We pray these things in the spirit of the living Christ. Amen. Let us continue to worship with our joy.